good to be here this morning. I'll show you a picture. This picture is, is one of my favorite pictures. It's, it's like a postcard. You know, a beautiful scene of uh, this, these newlyweds on the beach, sun is setting behind them, but that's actually not the complete picture. It's actually about the guy in the background. I think this couple photobomb, the guy ruling in the big one. And the point of this is not to look down on marriage. I'm a big supporter of marriage, have been for 34 years. But when I first looked at this, I, I didn't catch the guy in the background, and so I, uh, I kind of missed the point of the joke. And I show you this as an example of how sometimes we get so focused on what's right in front of us that we fail to see the big picture. And it reminds me of our Advent theme. And uh, we have four Sundays where we build up to Christmas, and it makes sense. We need to focus on an exciting time, the Christmas story that we find in Matthew 2 and Luke 2. But there's a bigger picture. Even in our society and even in our church, we spend a lot of time building up to Christmas. We have, we have a choir, we have decorations, we have food, we have gatherings, and all those things are good. It's worth celebrating. I think that's a good thing. We need to continue to do that. We celebrate God, the Father sending His Son, Jesus, to earth as a, as a little baby. But I fear that we neglect the big picture. Why is Jesus coming to earth so important? And last Sunday, Pastor Daniel started us on our Advent series. We're in the Minor Prophets, which are the, the short little books at the end of the Old Testament of your Bible. So, And as we read through today's text, you might wonder, as I did when I read this, and I thought, what do we see about Christmas in this story or in this chapter? So just be patient, hang with me, and keep in mind, we're looking for the big picture. Let's pray together before we open our Bibles. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, we gather, we can celebrate, and yet, Father, we know that there's, there's something more to this story than sometimes what we let on, certainly more than what our secular world sees. So, Father, I pray that as we uh, look into your word this morning at what your prophet had to say, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll expand our mind, you'll expand what we, what we see we won't be distracted by the things that don't matter, but we will focus on what is important. And so, Lord, I pray that you will speak through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday, Pastor Daniel was in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Today we'll be in the second last book of the Old Testament, which is Zechariah. So turn there, Zechariah. Can you guess who wrote the book of Zechariah? Zechariah, very good, yes. So he wrote the book of Zechariah 500 years before Christ was born. So as you're turning to the book, a little bit of background. After the kingdom of Israel split in two, the southern half, called Judah, they rebelled against the Lord. So in 586 B.C., the Lord allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to, to conquer Judah, which meant that Jerusalem was destroyed, the city was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, many people were killed, some were allowed to stay, but the rest were taken as captives back to Babylon. And in the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, verse 10, God said that the exile in Babylon would last for 70 years, so when Zechariah wrote this book, that time was almost over. But by this time, the Babylonians had been conquered by the Medes and Persians, and so the new king... King Darius was favorable to the Jews, and he allowed some of them to go back. Actually, he allowed all of them to go back, but they went back in, in stages. Zechariah was in the first group that returned to Jerusalem. So this small remnant of Jews that went back to Judah, which actually was changed to Judea, uh, Judea. the Babylonians changed the name, Judea was a very hard life when they went back because I mean, the, the King Darius, he demanded heavy taxes to be paid. They came back to Jerusalem. It was in shambles. The temple needed to be reconstructed, and so they started building. They laid the foundation, but there was so much opposition that uh, things had stalled, and for 10 years, nothing had happened. The people were discouraged. 
And even before the Babylonians invaded Judah, God promised, again through the prophet Jeremiah, he promised that he would bring the captives back from exile, they would rebuild Jerusalem, they would rebuild the temple, and he would restore the nation of Israel. Given the situation that the exiles are in here in Zechariah chapter 3, it seems very unlikely that these promises would come true. And here's where the prophet Zechariah comes in. And starting at chapter 1, we see this warning. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. Do not be like your ancestors. Do not be like your ancestors. Their ancestors had turned away from the Lord. They wouldn't listen to God's warning, and that's why they went into exile. And now some of them have returned but even those Jews were, were spiritually apathetic toward God. And it reminds me, here's a bit of a lesson here. I think we need to not make the mistake of our, our using the, the excuse of our parents and grandparents uh, for making bad choices or for being apathetic in our faith and blaming it on our ancestors because you may have not grown up in an environment at home where, where God was respected or Christianity or the Bible but as individuals, we still have the freedom to choose to follow God regardless of the influence of our parents, whether good or bad. And God says, do not be like your ancestors. So he's warning the Israelites. And then God gives Zechariah eight visions or dreams which are a window into the future. So turn to chapter 3. This is vision number 4. And as we see, God did not forget the promises that he had made to the Jews. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Let's start there. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick? snatched from the fire. So Zechariah, he's given this, this vision of a courtroom scene. And in that courtroom we have Joshua, the high priest. He's the defendant. Now this isn't the same Joshua that we read earlier in the Old Testament. This is a different Joshua. This Joshua is the high priest during Zechariah's ministry. He also returned with that first group back to Jerusalem, that first group of exiles. And Joshua, or Jeshua, your Bible might say, represents Israel. So the people who are about to come out of exile, and some have already returned, and if you were in Sunday school class earlier that meets over here, you'll, well, we went through some of this, so I was listening really intent, Daniel. I was hoping I was going to say the same things as you, and I think we're okay. But uh, yeah, so really interesting, this book. So we have this court case and then we have Joshua is standing before the angel of the Lord. And some believe this is the pre-incarnate Christ, Jesus before he came down in human form. I favor another view, which is that this angel simply speaks for God. And then we have the prosecutor in this court case, which is Satan, who is called the accuser. So in this vision of a court case, Satan is accusing Joshua of sin. Now, Joshua represents the Jewish people. So Satan is accusing the Jewish people or God's people of sin. And he doesn't give details of, of what his accusations are, but I think we can take a guess. Why were the Israelites sent into exile in the first place? They went through the motions of worshiping God, and yet at the same time they were worshiping other gods. And in doing so, they were disobedient. They had fallen short of God's standard. Satan's desire is for people not to have fellowship with God. He desires that people don't connect with God, and so he makes these accusations against the Israelites. And he's right. His accusations are true, because the angel of the Lord nor uh, Joshua even argue against these accusations. Now in verse uh, 2, 
He uses the name Jerusalem, and actually he uses that title to refer to the Jewish people. He says, how could, and I asked the question, how could Jerusalem be granted God's promises when they're guilty of sin? God won't bless people who reject him by being disobedient in their lifestyle. So it seems like an open and shut case. But before we get to the verdict, this scene really isn't that foreign to us because Satan is still the accuser. Do you ever get this nagging feeling that you don't measure up? I'm not smart enough, not successful enough, not pretty enough, not popular enough, not, not cool enough, whatever it is. I think we have this subconscious idea of what we think it takes to be accepted by other people, people you care about, even how we can be accepted by God. We have this idea in our head, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not adequate. I heard this definition of sin. Sin is when we try to fill our life with whatever it takes to cover up this sense of guilt or shame that comes when we feel like we've fallen short. I know that's a bit long. Let me read that again. Sin is when we try to fill our life with whatever it takes to cover up this sense of guilt or shame that comes when we feel like we've fallen short. This is something we can never attain. And so it can be consuming. It can be crushing. The Jewish nation represented by Joshua had fallen short. They didn't measure up. They didn't measure up to God's standards, so it seems pretty obvious they're guilty. Case closed. And yet, hold on, look at verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. In this, God is actually, he's rejecting Satan's accusations, and not because they weren't true, but because God chose to save his people in spite of their sin. And I see this as a, a beautiful illustration of how God's love, uh, how God shows his love by extending mercy and forgiveness to those who believe in him. And in this case, the people of Israel. And then at the end of verse 2, God implies that the Jewish exiles in Babylon were rescued from the punishment just before they were destroyed. He's like, a, like snatching a burning stick out of a fire before it's consumed. God goes on to illustrate his verdict. He uses symbols. Let's keep going. Verse 3 says, Now Joshua was dressed, dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Now that statement would have shock value in Zechariah's time because the high priest's wardrobe was very strict. And here you see an illustration of it. And you can see that there's, there's colors and there's precious stones on that picture, and, and they all represent something. There's a lot of uh, symbolism, and you notice that there's, there's white linen, and, so, and you, we know how white can get dirty really easy, but everything had to be perfectly clean. The standard was high, and the priest had to wear this, these clothes whenever he went into the tabernacle, this, this portable tent, and then later, when Solomon built the temple, into the Holy of Holies. This outfit signified purity, and while wearing these clothes, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and he would, uh, once a year, he would perform a, a, an elaborate ritual that God had commanded. Now this ritual atoned for the sins of the people. It was called the Day of Atonement. The high priest would, if he would enter this presence with filthy clothes, that was unthinkable. And that's what we see in Zechariah, or Zechariah's Vision. Now this phrase, go back to what the verse says, this phrase, filthy clothes, means more than dirt, a little bit of dirt on your clothes. When this word filthy is used in other parts of the Old Testament, it is describing vomit and human excrement. Absolutely disgusting. And so we can see that this would be unacceptable for the high priest to wear when he enters God's presence, wearing these filthy clothes. In this vision, the filthy clothes actually represent or stand for the symbol. It's a symbol of 
guilt or sin of Israel. God punished them for this sin by sending them into exile. So here we have the Jewish people represented by Joshua. They're unworthy to stand in the presence of God because of their sin, because of this, their filthy clothes. They've fallen short. They're inadequate. So let's apply this. Remember, sin can include trying to cover up our, our, our shame when we feel we've fallen short. And we may be trying to cover it up by, by thinking or trying to be smarter or, or cooler or more successful, prettier, more popular, whatever the case is. And religious people, we try and get rid of this shame of falling short by playing the scorecard game with God. You ever heard of the scorecard game? That's when we, we counter a, a spiritual or moral failing by, by doing something that we think will please God and we try and even the score, or, or better yet, we try and have our good outweigh the bad. And we fool ourselves when we do that. We fool ourselves into thinking that that will make us more acceptable. And when we do that, we fall into the trap of every other religion in the world a religion based on works. It's that hope that God will accept me based on what I do. And that's a feeble attempt to be accepted by a God who demands purity and righteousness and perfection. What hope do we have of being accepted by this God? There's only one way it's possible. Let's keep reading, verse 4. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. So instead of Joshua being kicked out of God's presence for wearing these filthy clothes, this, this sin... He's acquitted of the charges against him. He's declared not guilty. And then the angel orders that these filthy clothes be removed and replaced with clean or beautiful clothes, and that's symbolic of God removing the sin and guilt of the Jewish people and making him more acceptable to God, or making him acceptable to God, I should say. And not because they earned it, not because they deserved it, not because they were innocent of the charges, but because of God's grace extended in his, his great mercy to cleanse the Jewish nation. So we can see that these, these filthy garments are replaced with clean garments, and this is a symbol that the people have been restored. Their sin that led to their exile has been forgiven. They're no longer falling short. Now, when we feel like we have fallen short of God's standard, instead of admitting that we may try and, and cover it up by filling our lives, like I said, with some of these things like comfort or power or control, approval, whatever. We try and, we try and uh, uh, make up for it. We try and cover it up, but it doesn't work. And we still feel like there's something not right. We're not satisfied. It's, it's like we're wearing filthy garments. The Lord, in His great mercy, He removes these filthy clothes, replacing them with beautiful, clean clothes. He restores us, and we're satisfied. I heard an illustration, and I'm going to personalize it, and I hope this helps to explain what I'm talking about. Several years ago, my wife and I went to Hong Kong, a fascinating place. And one of the claims to fame I heard about Hong Kong is that you can, you can go there and you can get a suit tailor-made in just a few days quite cheap. So as a pastor, sometimes I wear a suit, so I thought, hey, this is a great opportunity to get a, a tailor-made suit. So we went to the area of Hong Kong where all the tailor shops were. We picked one, we walked in, and uh, on the wall they had you know, all these famous people that had come to their shop. One of them was Pierce Bronson, the actor. One was the mayor of London. So yeah, we just picked one, walked in, and they, uh, we picked out the color and the fabric, the design, and they measured me up. Went out, came back the next day, and tried it on. And of course, it's still kind of rough, so they fine-tune it, they measure it again, come back the next day, and it's finished. 
And I put it on, and I look in the mirror, and ah, not bad. Not bad. Pretty amazing change from coming in with jeans and a t-shirt to a tailor-made suit. It kind of makes you stand a little taller. Boost your confidence. And maybe you have something like that too. It might not be a suit. Something you put on and it ah, makes you feel a little better. You boost your confidence. And the point I'm trying to make is when you understand that on your own, you will always fall short of God's standard. You will never be satisfied. It just won't feel right. And it's like you're wearing filthy garments according to Zechariah 3. Verse 4 gives us a picture of of these filthy clothes being removed and replaced by clean clothes. It's like this new suit. You, you feel so much better when you put it on. It, it, it fits perfectly. It's, it's more adequate. There's, there's satisfaction. There's, there's confidence. These new garments that, that God gives, are, figuratively speaking, are so much better than those filthy garments we had on before. It's more adequate. There's satisfaction. There's confidence. We're made righteous because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. A blood is a symbolic of death, so Jesus' death cleanses us from the filth of sin, making us clean and acceptable to God. And that's the gospel message right there. When we understand that truth, it changes how you live. I think there's, there's a, a peace there's a calmness, there's this satisfaction in life that you didn't have before. So back to our story. When the Babylonians destroyed the temple and carried the, the Jews off into exile, the priestly duties ended right there in 586 B.C. From that time until Zechariah's time, where we're looking, no priest had gone before the Lord to represent the people. It ended. The Jews' sin had broke that relationship with God, so we have this, this vision of the, the filthy clothes being replaced by clean clothes, and that symbolizes that God forgave them, and He restored that relationship with them, which also meant that the priestly duties were reinstated. So once more, a high priest could come before the Lord to represent the people, which is really exciting news, except there's a problem. The temple was the means by which the high priest would come before the Lord, but we know that the temple was destroyed. The reconstruction had stopped for 10 years. So this part of the vision was to encourage the people to get back to rebuilding the temple so that the Lord could meet with them again through the high priest. And this is all exciting news. But the Lord makes it very clear that this reinstatement of the high priests was conditional. And that brings us to verse 6. Follow along as I read. The angel of the Lord gave, gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. So the Lord gives Joshua a warning. He says, don't take this, this priestly ministry or this access to God, that restored access, don't take that for granted. There's a condition. And it's actually fairly simple. Walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements. That was actually quite familiar to the Israelites because back in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and 30, Moses, this is called like the, uh, the, Mo the a covenant, Moses read this covenant to the people through several chapters, and, and really it comes down to, in a nutshell, I could summarize it saying, God saying, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you don't obey me, I will punish you. That's really the covenant in a nutshell. And here in verse 7, this conditional uh, is, is similar, but I think he's applying it to the priest because he says, they will govern my house and have charge over my courts. And that uh, has to do with a priestly duty. So he's giving a condition to the high priest. Then we get to verse 8 where it, sound, it feels like the angel of the Lord, he, he changes his, his tone or his, his gears a bit. He, instead of talking about the present, he is talking about the future. 
verse 8 says this. The angel of the Lord says, Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. Okay, so what is he talking about there? I think he's addressing Joshua's associates, meaning the fellow priests that assist him. And he says they are symbols of the things to come. So the obvious question is, what is to come? And which is answered in the very next verse, or in the next uh, sentence. It says, I am going to bring my servant the branch. In Scripture, we see this term branch used several times. You heard it twice earlier today. Thank you, Tony, for reading from uh, Jeremiah 23 and Isaiah 11, both referring to the branch. Look at, let's look at that Isaiah 11 passage again. It says, A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. He's talking about Jesse. We know that Jesse is the father of King David. In the New Testament, Apostle Paul is preaching in Antioch, and he repeats the Lord's promise concerning David, and it was given well over a thousand years earlier. And This is what he says. He says, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. That term should be familiar. We did a whole series on David not long ago. A man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And then he says this, Paul speaking of this promise God gave. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. So we can say with confidence, when Zechariah says, I'm going to bring my servant the branch, when I guess the Lord is saying this, he is referring to Jesus Christ, without a doubt. 500 years later, that promise was fulfilled with the arrival of Jesus as a human being, as a baby. So that one sentence, the end of verse 8, that is Christmas. That's what we celebrate every December 25th, the coming of the branch. Let's look at the bigger picture now. So let's go to verse 9, and we'll focus only on the last verse. I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. Now, there's a lot of ideas that I read about this verse, and I asked around, and there's different people have some different beliefs, but here's a few, probably the more common ones. Many believe that this is pointing to Christ's crucifixion when he sacrificed his life to atone for our sin. In the book of Hebrews, we read, But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. Jesus is called our high priest. And on the day, on the single day of his crucifixion, he gave his life as a sacrifice on our behalf. He atoned for the sin. He, the atonement was made and it was good for all time. The day of atonement was no longer needed. It was over. And that is certainly true. But there are other views that would say some commentators take this as a, a futuristic uh, interpretation, suggesting that Verses 9 and 10 are a picture of, of Christ's return after the tribulation period when he will set up his millennial kingdom. Let's read verse 10. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under the vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. A picture of peace and prosperity for those who are faithful to God. So still others, and I think I include myself in this, believe that the end of verse 9 and, and verse 10 could refer to both Christ's sacrifice, his crucifixion, and to the millennial kingdom to come. So this vision that Zechariah, Zechariah has, it makes it clear that our sin, represented by the filthy clothes we just read, that makes us unacceptable to God. And try as we may, there's nothing we could do to change it. Whatever we try will always fall short. Then Jesus, our high priest, came as a baby. And he grew to be a man for the purpose of dying in our place, taking on our sin and our shame. And in doing so, he symbolically replaced the dirty clothes that we have, and he replaced it with new clothes, making us acceptable to God and, and restoring that relationship with him. 
And if you can grasp that truth, that is the gospel, if you can grasp that truth, it will free you and it will enable you to live in peace and satisfaction regardless of the circumstances around you. So if this idea of, of peace and satisfaction is something that is foreign to you in your life right now, may I suggest that you don't understand the gospel. And myself or one of the pastors would love to talk to you about it. So this Christmas, I want us to look beyond this picture that we have of Christmas in our mind. I want us to look beyond that. I want us to look at the big picture where we see Christ's sacrifice one time for all. Anticipate his coming again. Praise God for his love and his, his mercy and his grace that was given to you that we see in this vision. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Courtney and Jill, they're going to come up and uh, they're going to sing the closing song for us. The words will be up on the screen and you can follow along or, or you can just read them as they sing. <laughs> 